could you come over? Uh, you would be. Yes. No, no, Carlos, come over. Okay, uh, so I, uh, a lot of you would have come with some expectations that it's a workshop on framework of principles and that looks big and come out to find out what kind of principles are we talking about. So we really do not have any framework of principles. Uh, uh, this is not, uh, as you may know, that this is not a typical workshop in the IGF uh, structure. Uh, this is a dynamic collation meeting, which is different from the typical workshops which you may have been attending since the morning. Uh, this is more of a space in which different actors get together and see what they can uh, do among themselves on an ongoing basis. Um, and these groups are called dynamic collisions. It was kind of an innovation of the IGF structure. Started with its first meeting in Athens. Uh, so the context of setting up this particular dynamic collision uh, has been that uh, there's general understanding that uh, we have this internet, uh, it's growing, uh, it's being shaped by various forces. We think it should be shaped by public interest. Uh, nobody's clear what kind of governance structures inform the shaping of the internet. So there was a general feeling that uh, the development of uh, the kind of principles which inform internet governance should happen in open uh, spaces and civil society thought that they should probably take a lead uh, in uh, developing that space where a lot of different actors can come and talk about what is basic to the internet, whether it's open character, it's network neutrality, it's democratic uh, character of being equal to all its users. What is, what is the kind of principles which should govern uh, the way internet evolves and then different institutions which have the direct job of uh, doing internet policies can be informed by, by those, those principles. So we set up the space to develop, uh, not even develop the process, to look at the kind of instruments, the kind of possibilities which could emerge. Everybody knew that internet is a transnational phenomenon. So the existing, uh, existing jurisdictions, existing political structures were inadequate uh, to meet the challenge of this transnational uh, internet. So something new was needed, and nobody knew and nobody knows till now, if you, as you would have seen if you've been moving around in the IGFs, uh, IGF meetings, that what kind of structures would be adequate uh, to govern the internet. Uh, so this dynamic collision started to figure out what kind of processes would be adequate. Somebody said a framework convention among countries, along with some other stakeholders, would be the kind of process you should uh, take up. Others said that the process should be more civil society led, would be a soft law kind of a process. We are later on that can influence uh, national jurisdiction. So this, these are the kind of dis possibilities we get together to discuss. So we have had uh, two meetings, one in Athens and one in Rio. Uh, so this meeting is open for people to talk whatever they wish to talk on this subject. We'll take inputs, see what can be done from now to the next meeting. Uh, whether any structural changes in the way we do work needs to be done, et cetera, et cetera. Now, some of my partners, uh, our partners, uh, my organization is IT for Change. We are an India-based NGO. Uh, our, uh, the Internet Governance pro Project, uh, John Matheson, uh, from that project, used to be most closely associated uh, with the work of this dynamic coalition. He's not here. The, uh, the IGP is being represented by Milton Mueller. And another partner from the start has been Ritz of Brazil. Uh, Carlos Afonso is here. Then CAST from China has been associated with this work from the start. We have uh, members from CAST sitting in the audience. A uh, couple of other organizations who could not make it. Uh, Panos of West Africa, Ken Lohinto was with us. He couldn't come. His trip got canceled at the last moment. And El Faredi from Peru, uh, Eric, is somewhere here. We'll hope to see him before the, uh, the workshop closes. So these, these are the groups who have been working together. Uh, so I would uh, allow Milton and Carlos to say a few words. Uh, but before that, I, I would uh, mention that there has been some talk among some groups, uh, the chief group among them being the Bill of Rights Dynamic Coalition, of which two some members are present in the audience, to see whether we can bring the work of these organizations closer together. 
or probably also create a common space uh, to take uh, the work forward. For uh, those of you who were uh, in the Internet Governance Caucus meeting yesterday, a uh, few of uh, you I can identify were there. There was, a, there was a kind of a discussion in that caucus about the possibility of developing a common rights-based uh, agenda. Uh, I would a uh, little later distinguish why we directly did not go to a rights-based uh, framework, but we thought uh, you know, principles uh, is something slightly different from a typical bill of rights. Uh, I'll, I'll come back to it. But there, there is some talk that can we put it together, we can talk about some rights-based principles or whatever, uh, and, and work together to see that the forthcoming IG apps are informed with uh, human right centric uh, agenda and uh, and whether we can i mean change our ways to work uh, in our dynamic coalition so i leave uh, the floor to milton and then to carlos to share their views on this matter um okay so um yeah we were interested uh, coming out of i'm sorry Coming out of WSIS, uh, as you know, the, the uh, charge was to develop uh, globally applicable public policy principles for the Internet. Uh, and uh, uh, we also had long experience proceeding with this uh, in ICANN. And um, we're familiar with the ongoing debate within ICANN over the role of governments in ICANN. And, uh, we were convinced that GAC, uh, this idea of having a government advisory committee, was kind of the wrong model, that you had uh, basically, in some ways, the worst of both worlds. You had governments in the system uh, sort of interfering with the policy development process of civil society and business, and yet at the same time as the, ge the governments were influencing policy, they were not subject to normal governmental checks and balances, uh, for example, going back to their uh, their national legislatures for approvals of whatever policies they said were public policies. So we were very concerned, and as you know, last year we had a uh, workshop on public policies, which I believe uh, you were on, right? And uh, um, so we have an ongoing concern with some of the same issues. Uh, and the idea of a framework of principles uh, was that we came up with the idea of a framework convention that the, the, the governments would uh, develop a general framework that defined principles within which internet governance would operate and that those principles would leave it f clear and free for the civil society and private actors to uh, develop their own norms and rules within the basic framework that, that was transnational and global in applicability. Now, a number of things have caused us to step back from the framework convention idea Number one uh, is that um, the realm of internet governance is so broad uh, in, in involving so many different topical areas that many people challenge the feasibility of the idea. So one uh, way of perhaps narrowing, narrowing that down is to focus on questions of individual rights as they apply at the global level particularly these fundamental ones regarding things like freedom of expression and privacy and due process is what we like to put an emphasis on. Uh, so we find this idea of bringing the, the focus onto rights as being one that's compatible with our original concerns and possibly one that uh, solves some of the problems with our original approach, which maybe was too broad, too vague, and uh, uh, we're willing to, to move in that direction. Yes, um, I would like also to comment that there are several efforts to, to develop similar uh, frameworks, and uh, uh, particularly from civil society, APC has tried to develop a charter. You know, and uh, they, we are uh, basically trying to work under that charter uh, as APC members, several members of the APC. And uh, there is another one which I have been participating personally, which is de being developed by a multi-stakeholder organization, which is the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee, in which there is government, private sector, civil society organizations, the academic sector, etc. And we, sh we set out to write a 10 
principles, arbitrarily set as STEM principles, no? and including uh, the question of uh, privacy, freedom of expression, connectivity, universalization, net neutrality, etc. And we are now, we managed to, to write 13 principles, and uh, we are trying to, to, to make it more compact, but still there is a lot of discussion. We are about four months, four to five months discussing it, and this is a small group, a group of 22 council members, no? And uh, it is really not easy to set out. But the point is, if we, the, the, the goal is to have a set of principles, a framework in which governments could uh, use, and the private sector, and NGOs, and whatever, whoever runs or benefits from the internet, no? uh, can use in their, in their work, uh, it would be great, but uh, it's not easy to do. So we we have a big challenge. But we don't. Re we need to remember that there are several efforts already going on, and we could take a look at them, try to to see what they are doing and uh, how they arrived, and why are those the principles they sh they have chosen, and not the others, etc. Uh, I'll. Uh Request our another other member of the dynamic coalition uh, cast to uh, make any comments if they wish at uh, this stage or they want to come in later. You want to say anything now, please? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I come from CAST. Actually, I'm a professor of a uh, university. Uh, I'm very honored uh, to be here. And, uh, Invited by. Mike, please. A mic's probably not working very well, Professor. Okay. Yeah. Actually, I'm a member of CAST. Actually, I'm a <coughs> professor of a university. It's my honor to come here and um, talk something about our research. Uh, in actually, uh, in uh, six, in six, in workshop 33. We also have a workshop on global culture for cyberspace security. And for, for me, my research is uh, how to, uh, when we meet an emergency, for example, uh, hurricanes, floods, earthquakes, and so on, how to guarantee the quake and the QS service assured. QS means a quality of services. Access is uh, of great importance. And I suggest uh, some space spatial norms on the aspect of emergency access of internet should be proposed. If we can make out plain, do some investigation beforehand, reach an agreement on how to deal with emergency, then we'll, we'll be able to resolve the trouble efficiency and make internet more affordable and accessible. Thank you. Uh, as our Cast colleagues uh, put it, I think there are many dimensions to the emerging internet ecology than to look at very narrow, you know, the kind of rights we know. Uh, the whole ecology of the internet is developing, and that, that's the reason we have been talking about principles about the internet and just not the rights about the internet. Uh, I mean, for example, network neutrality is, is a principle and looks very difficult to say it's a right. Uh, we know there are common spaces between the two sets, but since we are dealing with a forming reality, uh, this was a reason we, we keep on coming back to principles uh, as well, of the kind of principles which can guide the formation of this new emerging reality. So I, I open it to the floor now to comment uh, about uh, how they see civil society and other groups can work together to develop those principles, how we can see uh, us working with other groups which could be doing the kind of work uh, Carlos mentioned, other groups who are developing rights-based approaches, uh, how the principles of the internet and the rights of, on the internet, they can be pulled together into some kind of a common work, which gives us more momentum, more visibility, and more possibility of impact, uh, which we are all seeking. So the floor is open. Andrew. Thanks, Prime Minister. Uh, Andrew Pulipat from Global Partners. Um, we've been doing some work for the Ford Foundation, which is involved, and it, there are obviously a whole lot of parallel conversations, because one of the things we've done is develop a set of principles 
to frame sort of digital network communication. The way we started the process for ourselves working with some other NGOs was around values. Because I think it's very hard just to come in at principles unless you're clear what the normative values are that you're grounding those principles in. And it seems to me that a more collaborative discussion among a, a wider range of groups would probably start at the level of, of values. I mean, the ones that we thought of were accessibility, diversity and pluralism, participatory and transparent governance, openness, creativity and innovation. Those seem to us to be the core values that the principles should be based upon. But I don't know if your own work on principles, you, you had a set of values that you were agreed upon which you use to, to base your initial thinking. That would be an interesting uh, reflection for me. But I think in terms of broad, you know, making sure that we don't have a whole series of separate conversations, I wonder if values is the place to start. What is it that we want this environment to reflect and guarantee? And then we can think about the principles that would do that. Um, Anyone of you want to comment on this? Can I, can I just add quickly to that? I, I work with Andrew, so it's really just I'm drawing on that. I'm, I'm Lisa from Global Partners as well. Um, I've, as, as Andrew said, we've been working on, on our own framework um, in association with, um, with six other um, NGOs, um, and Graciela from, from Ritz was involved in that process as well. Um, and I'm seeing a lot of overlaps here um, with the APC um, Internet Rights Charter. Um, yesterday in the GigaNet Forum, um, there was a presentation um, which um, looked at principles, one of the main issues um, that, are, that, are, that are emerging here. They, they, and they all are boiling down to the same issue. So I think there is an emerging consensus. Um, issues such as inter interoperability, privacy, etc. Um, and so I think that there is a need for, for coordination of these different initiatives. Um, and I think that there'll be I don't think that would be difficult because I think they are very much looking at the same kind of principles and I think that's an important step, something we can maybe start to move towards in this kind of forum. Hello. Uh, <clears throat> it's interesting because several of these <clears throat> initiatives you know, that are going on are <clears throat> focusing on, on different views of uh, what those principles are or uh, what they are for. Like our uh, initiative in Brazil is, fo uh, is focused, is from the point of view of for an organization which is an internet governance organization, which runs the domain name system in Brazil and uh, uh, regarding the CCTLD.br and a few other activities you know, re related to internet governance, especially the, the infrastructure. So the principles that we are writing there are from the point of view of internet governance and uh, uh, and uh, like APC is from the point of view mostly of the final user you know, and uh, more, far more broader than, than the one we are doing. And several other examples are with different point of, points of view or different fo focuses you know, in which you can uh, have a view of those principles. I think that uh, the, the idea of doing a single, uh, all embrace, embracing framework is a big challenge, but we should try at least to, to, to see what is common, what is the thread that unites or goes through all of them. No? Hello, um, my name is Mark Sengers. I'm chairing the Internet Bill of Rights Coalition. And um, as Parminder and I have discussed before, I think um, the work that you are doing here at the um, Framework and Principles is um, very much related to the work that we are doing at the um, Internet Bill of Rights. And we are more than interested to uh, work with you and build on top of, um, I think, what, um, it's very complementary to the um, ideas that we are developing there. So um, in that um, sense, I would like to invite you to um, maybe take advantage of the community that we are having in the Internet Bill of Rights, which leads to um, a little bit more of a dynamic discussion. Um, as we all know, these Internet um, mailing lists need a certain critical mass, so I think by um, joining in um, the discussion and moving it um, in a shared space, because most of the people who are interested in the frameworks and principles are also interested in um, the Bill of Rights. So. Um, I would like to extend that invitation and um, would certainly um, encourage us to work as closely together as possible. 
Are you saying something? Okay. Well, I could uh, intervene here. Um, yeah, that's sort of uh, where I, I was kind of interested in going was towards um, some kind of um, uh, merging of the two perspectives. Uh, in other words, when we talk about principles, um, uh, we need to, uh, what's the right word? Um, we need to find what level of principle we're talking about. I think that's sort of that's what Andrew was saying, you know, what, what uh, level of principles. And I think the, the really important ones and the ones that may be missing from a lot of the dialogue, uh, unless we bring it in, is going to be the, uh, the rights of people with respect to internet-based communications. Um, and rights can, can handle a very broad perspective of issues and topics, but at the same time, if you ground it in notions of uh, you know, the individual human being and, and how they interact with the internet, then, then it can become much more abstract and simple and can be applied to a wide variety of topical areas, ranging from internet addressing uh, to privacy, uh, to uh, expression, uh, content regulation issues, uh, even the child protection, uh, which threatens to become, in my opinion, frequently be threatens to become a reactionary kind of approach to, to the internet, uh, if conceived in a rights framework, can become compatible with what many of us are concerned about. So, so I like what uh, Max is proposing. Yeah. Take uh, what uh, Milton just now said as the point of departure of how many of our approaches look reactionary to the other approach. <laughs> Typically, the, the rights-based approach is kind of a reactionary to an established world reality, uh, and we, people have made political claims against an established world. You know, uh, When we are into changing times as we are now, uh, we are dealing with uh, I mean, different kind of perspectives, the kind of things which Carlos said, that different, kind, different groups are trying to make uh, different sets of principles in different areas. Uh, so we, 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 I think there's a couple of tensions here between the way the principles-based approach is seen or the rights-based approach is seen. The kind of tensions I would like to uh, try to put finger uh, on now is that there is a certain institutionalist approach and is a certain human-centric approach. Now, both are important, and we're trying to uh, both on the both sides try to maximize our impact on policies because right now policy is being made and very important policies are being made. Uh, we just heard the ITU chief talk about the cybersecurity. Uh, some group uh, is they are setting up a cybersecurity principles group or something like that. Uh, the private sector, many com companies have got together and uh, done this. Is it GNI? What is it? Uh, global network initiative. Uh, global network initiative. So there, there are a lot of lawmaking, principle setting changes right now taking place, and our effort is to maximize our impact on it. So there are differences, like uh, Milton said, even child rights could be a rights-based framework rather than a reactionary thing to other rights. Security. I mean, security is important. Everybody knew what happened in Mumbai, and that's a security issue. So it's not that you know, security is not important for people who are talking about rights. So the, bringing all those concerns together is a challenge. But if we can agree to a minimum that, yes, there, we are for the public interest, these interest, these challenges can be met, these interests can be brought together in a, in a framework of principles and rights, or principles or rights. So we can be working together. We, we are people who are like-minded. We have same kind of conceptions broadly about public interest. Then this is workable. And one last line. We know that we are talking about a global reality. And the political systems, the political thinkings in different parts of the globe are different. And that directly concerns the conception of rights. Uh, there are debates that won't seize immediately on you know, building one particular rights-based conception. To accept different political realities within the broad you know, normative frameworks which we, we are ready to live with. Uh, so we need to accommodate the institutionalist view vis-a-vis -vis the human-centric one and accommodate a different set of political realities and then talk about principles and rights uh, about the internet. So I think we, we have this challenge. Can, can you quickly tell me what you mean by the institutionalist view? I'm not sure what people mean by that. Uh, that's the principal kind of thing. You know, this uh, institutionalist view, hum, rights are generally a very human-centric thing. An institutionalist view is uh, more of legal principle uh, 
principles based uh, view. Do you see the difference here? Uh, not really. I mean, I think uh, rights uh, are embodied in institutional frameworks. So. Right, right. They are. So I think it's a, it's a matter, difference of emphasis. Uh, I would say that people who are public policy makers think more institutionally, and generally uh, civil society people would uh, look at more a human you know, rights-centric viewpoint. They may be talking about the same issue. So that, that's the kind of a thing, the typical public policy frame the thing, thinking. Uh, yeah, Max. If I may react to, um, if I may react to um, your comments and uh, I think um, completely valid uh, concerns about how to promote your thinking within um, the Internet Bill of Rights uh, framework, and I think um, what's what's important to point out is that the Internet Bill of Rights sees itself as a platform to support exactly all kinds of initiatives like the Freedom of Expression um, Coalition, like the Privacy Coalition, and you are more than welcome in the family, um, either as a contributing um, a dynamic coalition of yourselves, or if you prefer to uh, um, increase the critical mass and the, the um, people that discuss the principles and framework that you're talking about. Um, we have very heterogeneous um, in initiatives and groups together or in, under the roof of the Bill of Rights. And in that sense, I'm um, very positive that we can accommodate your perspective as well. Yeah, so Max, the final uh, uh, work on this we can take uh, after the meeting, but we would like to hear what people say. I, I can see a lot of convergence on uh, working together uh, on this issue. Yeah, thanks. Parminder, thanks. And speaking of convergence, would you agree that in general, um, there is a certain convergent, a certain um, common set of goals uh, between uh, what you would term institutional agencies and uh, civil society, in that uh, the concerns are always about, uh, shall we say, the public good. But sometimes there's a gap that might need to be uh, bridged. And uh, engagement with these agencies and uh, kind of trying to achieve a common ground with these agencies might be a good idea because or else we see these uh, going into divergent paths all too frequently. Uh, I didn't completely catch the, uh, the question, but I, if, if I get you right, I, I think I, I myself am saying that we need to bridge the gap between the way civil society thinks and the way public uh, policymakers think. Uh, that that's the kind of thing you're talking about, the institution's uh, perspectives, the way they think about issues? It is, yeah, it, it, um, there are two things that I'm concerned with. One is, uh, shall we say, a language and perception gap. And the second thing is that uh, the actors on both these uh, sides of the bridge uh, don't necessarily mingle with each other all as frequently as would be uh, optimum for this kind of initiative. So some organization or the other, either civil society or these groups have to go more than halfway. And a place like the IGF uh, where uh, people here or on an even footing and when there's no particular mandate to do anything or set any policy would be a perfectly neutral venue for these discussions. So if uh, some kind of engagement, increased engagement with these groups uh, could be achieved, uh, that is something I'd count as uh, excellent goal. Which groups are they talking about? Actually, talking about ITUs of this world, ITUs of this world, or whoever makes policies. Yeah, please. I'm sorry, you've been raising your hand for a long time. Uh, my name is Stefano Rodotà. I am professor of law in Rome, and now I am the chair of the scientific committee of the Agency for Fundamental Rights of the European Union. First of all, uh, I think that the positive outcome of the Internet Governance Forum since uh, Athens and before the crisis in Tunis uh, the important outcome is the production of different dynamic coalitions. I think that it's the right moment for having a rationalization of this approach through dynamic coalitions. And uh, I, I, as professor of law, I would like to discuss about the differences between principles and rights. But in this very moment, I think that it could be more useful to have a common platform where these different approaches can confront themselves to have not only, it is very important, I agree with Max, 
a critical mass from, from the political point of view, it's very important. For instance, in the perspective and of the next and maybe final uh, Internet Governance Forum in Cairo, for having a plenary session on these problems, not only workshop, not only meeting of dynamic coalition, only if we have a <coughs> critical and obviously political mass, we can reach these results, first of all. Second, I think that uh, we are working, and uh, Max has uh, many, has very, uh, made an important work about in IBR, Internet Bill of Rights, is a good brand in the uh, world of the Internet discussion. But in any case, it's important to be conscious that we need principle and rights. We can discuss this point. But in this very moment, I think that we must be aware that some basic principles of the so-called original constitution or code of, of internet are under discussion. It's net ne neutrality is under discussion Make with different uh, approaches and arguments termination fees for having more resources, intervention with some discrimination for avoid the collapse of internet and so on. And in any case, net neutrality, until, until now, a fundamental principle of not of the constitution of internet is under discussion. Another point under discussion is anonymity. You know how now is wide the discussion about IP traceback. Yeah. This is an, it, this was another point on the uh, level of principles under discussion. And what is happening now about the problem of data protection? What uh, I have seen, and maybe you know, that are also non-official but important documents at the level of the European Union asking for making possible the retention of all data produced by people, all data, it, it also at the level of the Internet of Things. This, uh, some people said we have to avoid a digital tsunami. So some basic principles protecting us in the broad sense, in the dimension of internet are under, are challenged. So I think that the union of different dynamic coalition could be, could give us a good instrument for fighting against and give the basis for a new and strong uh, framework of principles. Please. Next. Uh, Margaret Moran, MP, a UK uh, Member of Parliament, and I suspect the only democratically elected policymaker here. Uh, and as such, I just wanted to ch uh, just challenge the, what you, seemed to be a dichotomy emerging in some things that you were saying and others were saying, that uh, policymakers are look, at, look to institutional solutions uh, as opposed to civic society. I want to say that in, in the context of, um, the, of the, the new technology, I'm a legislator that doesn't want to legislate because I think the, the shape and change of the outcomes of technology moves so fast that actually something like a Bill of Rights which smacks too much to me of legislation, will become outdated faster than it could ever be enacted. And we will always be in a position where we're chasing our tails in terms of legislation. I prefer the, the principles approach, but I just wanted to ask a question as well, which is, who is who's involved in these dialogues? Uh, I increasingly become concerned that these kind of discussions are involving the, the same kind of people all the time with the same kind of perspectives. Now, I'm sorry, that sounds like a, a generalization. I'm sure it's a very broad coalition of people. But the point I'm trying to make is that this dialogue doesn't just include civic society. We've got to have some dialogue 
with the people who will be at the receiving end of a Bill of Rights or a set of principles. And actually, those challenges are much more complex. Uh, you know, data trace back, a lot of my constituents would say yes, because that will say, you know, I don't want a terrorist to blow me up. Uh, you may say no, because that's about freedom of my, you know, protection of my inf information or data security or et cetera, et cetera. The danger is we've turned into an academic debate. And I'd just like to make a suggestion, which I think maybe the IGF needs to think about, which is that perhaps we ought to pose some of these Naughty dilemmas uh, and have an, uh, 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 walk the talk in a sense, have an e participation with ordinary citizens so as to help inform our dialogue rather than us, select few that manage to get here or get involved in the IGF, assuming that we know what the answers are. Uh, I'll just comment very briefly before I pass the mic to the next speaker. Yeah, uh, Milton would also like to come in briefly after that. I think uh, that's exactly the effort here, that we could have gone on with our dynamic coalition meeting every year and other dynamic coalitions meeting, but we need some kind of a political mass, some kind of a political set of possibilities to move forward and the kind of things which you spoke about as a rationalization of the dynamic process. Right now, we, we are very interested as an advocacy group, set of groups that what is the kind of thing we can do to make a political impact? And this brings for the kind of issues you're talking about to get the right kind of people in, in our discussions. And, and we are looking to see how we can pull together the work we are doing and make an impact on the agenda of the next IGF, get other actors who can actually make changes into this debate. So the, the, the precise purpose of opening the discussion today is to be able to move forward in some kind of a uh, politically impactful uh, way if it's possible. Yeah, just to clarify, um, I was struck by your comment that you saw uh, a Bill of Rights sounded too much like legislation and you preferred to talk at the level of principles. Um, let me give you a specific example. We had been talking as IGP about a principle of net neutrality and we now think it makes sense to back off from that and go to what we think is a higher level of gen generality and talk about the general human right to freedom of expression, which is what makes net neutrality interesting to us. Okay, we don't care about the technology or regulatory implementation of net neutrality. What we care about is the principle of freedom of expression or the general human rights. So maybe we should be talking about human rights principles and that's the way to to square that circle. Yeah, Andrew, after uh, uh, the lady there. Yeah. Yes, uh, Carlos mentioned the APC's um, Internet Rights Charter, and I actually wanted to point out to everybody that there's a copy of it in your backpacks that you got yes, from IGF. Um, my copy's in Spanish. I'm hoping that um, there's an, no, there's not an assortment. Um, well, then I just recommend that everybody, you know, when you have internet access or wireless, um, Google that and check it out because it is a really, um, I think, a very, very good attempt uh, to articulate these human rights principles, tie them to the articles of internationally accepted human rights documents, um, and then elaborate how they apply to the internet. Um, and uh, the question that I would like to, to follow on with that is um, whether either of the dynamic, any of the dynamic coalitions that are working on these topics also have um, draft text or proposed text that people can, can look at and react and respond to, and if so, where to find them. But I don't ask. Uh, can you introduce yourself, or Carlos would? Oh, I'm sorry, my name's Leah Shaver, and I'm from the Yale Information Society Project. PC charter, and actually we use it as the basis for a document that we're um, starting to write together right now. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, thanks, uh, Andrew. Put it back again. It's, I mean, it's really good, good to have a legislator here. So I'm really glad Margaret's here, particularly one from the UK, because it means I can talk to her when I'm back home uh, <laughs> rather than in Hyderabad. One of the, I mean, I think the point of the IGF process is it should bring together. Uh, a much diverser group of uh, people to talk about these issues than is traditionally the case. One of the problems that I think those of us who try to engage, say, governments in the discussion is that they tended to be very much focused on 
uh, the secu you know, security issues, or in the case of the British government and their representation, child protection. Now, f as a human rights activist, I think that's an incredibly important issue, and engaging with the security agenda, as Milton said, is a very important one. But what we, what, what is, what we found very hard is to engage governments in the broader potential, or, the, or a discussion about the broader potential of network communications in the internet to liberate uh, human potential around the globe. It's development potential, it's educational potential, it's creative potential, there's a massive potential. And while we can engage the Council of Europe, and we can engage the European Commission, maybe because they're more removed from the day-to-day -day pressures that legislatures face in some countries, uh, it has been difficult, and we've met Alan Michael uh, in the UK to try and raise his issues, to get beyond the narrow set of issues that the legislators want to pursue. So one of the things I'd welcome as, a, as an opportunity here is to figure out how we can have this broader based value discussion with a much broader constituency of people than we've been able to achieve in the past. But I don't think that's because the civil society groups are unwilling to engage in that discussion directly with government and business. We want to find a way of doing it that's constructive and takes us forward. Uh, just a brief comment. I think we did see when Milton came back uh, to Margaret's comment that there's a back and forth between rights or principles, or principles or rights, uh, values first. You know, I think we should admit this much that the situation which we are facing is very unique. And that's because the internet is moving so fast and things are changing so fast that we are, you know, we are not into a crystallized rights kind of an approach and the people who talk about now. Milton says that first I thought about rights and that I thought principle is better and then probably again right is better. So we have a, we have a real problem about the principle and right stuff here. Uh, that, that's just an observation. Anybody? Yes, Lisa? I guess just to comment on that, and I'd hand this over to the human rights, the lawyers and, and the people with that kind of background, can you not have a rights-based principle? Um, and that's what, that's what we've been trying to do in our work, so I'd be or interested to hear principle based rights, if, um, <laughs> Yeah, see, I guess I, I'd look at it as a, as a rights-based yeah. principle. And so just to give a back, bit of background about what we've been doing, um, we've taken uh, freedom of expression as a core human right, looking at it in its expansive sense as encompassing access to information, um, access to uh, the ability to p participate in public debate, etc. Um, and from that, try to distill down what that means in the networked communications environment. Um, so bringing in principles of net neutrality. What principles do you need to really fully realize the human right to freedom of expression? And so that's, I guess, the way that I would resolve that kind of dilemma between rights and principles is, is this, this notion of um, rights-based principles. Um, and then just to backtrack about uh, the, um, the dynamic coalition on the Internet Bill of Rights, um, I. As I understand the coalition, it's, we're trying to be a platform for debate and discussion about these issues. So just to clarify, it's not really trying to draft a new Internet Bill of Rights as such. Um, the Bill of Rights that could emerge from that is, could be a collection of different tools and instruments, um, could be firmly rooted within the, the International Bill of Rights that we have already. So just wanted to, to clarify on that, that it's really a platform to, for discussion and debate at the moment, rather than trying to create this, this, this you know, new Bill of Rights. Yeah, and Lisa, too, just to add to it, there is also a feeling that we need to give some political momentum, uh, a new set of political possibilities to the kind of work we are doing. And the, that's the kind of uh, thing which we probably are trying to do with putting it on the agenda of the IGF or, you know. So that may require a little different uh, approach as well, apart from just giving a, giving a platform, probably uh, talking more concretely in a, in a way we can Im make impact. Uh, Michael, go stream. This guy's the Travi who came on supporting that team. Hmm? Hi, uh, Mike Gerstein. Um, uh, I guess I'll, I'll repeat myself if anyone's ever heard me talk about these things. But uh, the uh, a problem that I see with this discussion is that it is, uh, in terms of the constituency, that is being addressed and the constituency that's participating, the discussion is far too narrow. And uh, I'm sorry, that's what you said? Uh, well, I'll, I'll, okay, thank you. Okay, uh, in the sense that uh, those who are taking the most advantage 
the transformative advantage of the internet. Uh, from my experience, in fact, our indigenous people, uh, for a whole variety of reasons which I can go into, but indigenous people are uh, globally, I think, the ones who are taking, the, making the use of the internet uh, as the basis for a really profound transformation in the way in which they relate to the larger society. And those who are more advanced um, in the use of it are, in fact, the most advanced in that transformation. Uh, and yet I don't see any representation here of them, and I don't see any outreach to including them. And uh, should that be the case, should there be an inclusion of them, I think that this discussion would have a depth and probably be different than, and, and, a, and an outcome that would be rather different. Uh, and I, and I, I use indigenous people because I think they're the, the ones from my experience who do have had the most transformative use, but uh, grassroots users in general uh, in developing countries and in non-developing countries, in fact, have used it. And I don't, again, don't see any participation by grassroots users or any systematic outreach or attempt to include grassroots users uh, in these discussions around the nature of rights and the nature of, of principles in the internet. And, and I would actually now also include that as including grassroots users uh, of virtual participation, a virtual, not just grassroots uh, physical users or f people representing physical communities, but also those re representing virtual communities who in fact are in the process of, of uh, being transformative in the use of their internet as we've seen very recently in the, in the US elections. And uh, so I, I mean, I guess I would challenge uh, those who are discussing it to in fact look on these issues in a much broader and more inclusive way and before, you know, as I mean also, not only is it uh, likely to change the content, but in fact including those as part of the discussion would give these discussions an enormous weight and political uh, direction that it, I think it lacks, so. Hi. Thanks, um, I certainly support everything Michael just said from the bit of experience I've had working with Indigenous people and they're quite unique uses of the medium, which um, I won't go into here, but I think there is stuff there. But I wanted to try and bring this back because, you know, the structures we adopt and that should be related to what we're trying to achieve here. And I think what needs to be achieved within the area of Internet Governance Forum, which is primarily about Internet governance, is probably a few things. And you probably need to think about how you structure around those. So, for instance, a Bill of Rights, I think it's a fantastic thing. I think it's a fantastic thing because 20 years hence we should be looking forward to visionary statements just as people now still look at John Perry Barlow because it was there and it said things that were very important and very wide-reaching. And that's one thing that's got to be achieved. Another thing that's got to be achieved is the capacity to react directly to the public policy issues involving rights and principles which are coming from internet practice and growing internet government today. You know, and these affect existing bodies where there should be existing bodies perhaps and there is nothing, but these are the sort of day-to-day -day issues where rights issues have, have really got to be addressed and got to be addressed somewhere here. And, and that's, I don't think, a Bill of Rights. It might be something where that coalition and the same voices in it want to act in another capacity sort of thing. So I would, I'd just be very careful of getting everything into one structure if that restricts your capacity to act on a number of fronts and for a number of voices. Um, and I, I do think this other area, which is not Bill of Rights, but which is rights-based activism and almost reactive activism to what's happening in the internet space at this point of time is extremely important and whatever structures and coalitions are here. And I would like to think that there was coalitions that involve business people and government who would look at these reactive issues as well. So it should not just be a civil rights sort of um, face. You know, we've got one of those and um, may it grow. But, you know, I mean, I, I think there's a number of different things to be achieved. and really interested in how we evolve to be able to sort of deal with all of these issues. This again uh, comes back to what uh, Nathan Desai was saying about uh, there being two sets of people here. One group that thinks the current uh, structures are, the governance structures are like, uh, they're good, they're stable, any changes are going to break them. 
And another set that says we are stakeholders, we need a stake, and uh, we need a say in policy. But a possible bridge would be that most of these organizations, uh, such as at least the RIRs that do IP allocation policy, have quite open and uh, bottom-up membership-driven uh, policy development processes. And uh, they're not close to access like, uh, for example, some government for intergovernment forums and participation in those, and I know several of you have participated in those, uh, might be a good idea. And in fact, uh, it might be a much more appropriate uh, venue for this. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I came a bit late in this discussion, so I don't know what has already been said. Uh, but uh, when it comes to the question of uh, what we need in this context, and I think that uh, the internet mm -hmm community, like any social community, needs rules. And uh, what we're looking for is here to use uh, the rules which we can find in the Universal Declaration and in the implementing documents, conventions, and so on, for a rights-based approach to the issues which come up in, in various uh, contexts and where there is a need for orientation and uh, this orientation we can develop, commonly develop, in a broad-based approach uh, to give this necessary uh, orientation uh, based on the uh, human rights which are there already and on which uh, basis a code can be developed which interprets these human rights in the various contexts. And I think, like Milton said, uh, in the case of net neutrality, you can make use of that so in other contexts as well. Uh, and uh, this is a collective undertaking. I think it's not the issue to draft a bill, and this is sometimes a bit confusing, but it's not the idea. Uh, the idea is uh, to uh, use what we already have for the new challenges which the Internet brings with itself. And this is something where we have uh, dynamic coalitions to take a lead, but which where we should uh, be as integrative and as ex inclusive as possible. Thank you. Uh, uh, just uh, quickly, I'm Stuart Hamilton from the International Federation of Library Associations, and um, I've listened to this, and uh, I'd like to agree with the point just made because we have had a what we call library manifesto, internet manifesto, since 2002, which is grounded entirely in Article 19. Uh, and it sets out the principles that librarians should provide internet access to in relation to the rights of their users. So um, I've just been listening to the discussion. I think this might be interesting from a principles point of view. We've kept it quite narrow, but it's available on the IFLA website, ifla.org, if it's of any use to anyone. Yeah, Professor. Oh, I would like to avoid a misunderstanding. Never. Never the Internet Bill of Rights has been conceived as a bottom-up process, as a traditional way to an international convention. I remember because I was among the people who signed in Tunis the first document on Internet Bill of Rights, that Internet Bill of Rights has been conceived as a process involving, first of all, the internet community, a multi-stakeholder, multi-level process. And we can have also intermediate steps. For instance, uh, we have to look to some convention existing to, for instance, support in this very moment there is a discussion about the possibility of an international convention on data protection. This could be an important step on the road of the Internet Bill of Rights, but it means a process precisely. And I think that in this uh, logic and having in mind this kind of work that the Internet Bill of Rights dynamic conventions has been created. So I think that we can, uh, we can work in this way, following this original idea. And I am not aware, uh, I, I am not 
uh, afraid that we can change this approach. Uh, the only way for having an Internet Bill of Rights as the result of different instruments, we have in this very moment, we have to confront ourselves with the, the declaration on the freedom of expression by Google, Microsoft, and Yahoo. This is an important po problem. And how can the dynamic coalition look at this document? And uh, how have we to com confront ourselves with the true governance of YouTube privatized? This is this is for that that I think that we have to make reference, for instance, to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, we are now uh, having the 60 years. We are celebrating the 60 years of this declaration. But for instance, freedom of expression is now to be looked at that with a fresh and different approach. And this is, that's the way, uh, on, this is the way for working for the dynamic coalitions. Uh, just a short comment, uh, and after that, Milton. Uh, when you say that the Bill of Rights is a process, I think uh, it doesn't give that impression to many people. Uh, the Bill of Rights gives an impression of like there's no. a you know thing you're going to pull out, uh, yes. uh, the no, scroll, no, no, scroll. Yes. <laughs> we, we try it to yeah. clarify. Yeah, this I know, but as an up, down, and no bottom yeah, down. Right, 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 sure. Yeah, I, I just like what you said, um, but I, I find myself wanting to reach for something more concrete as a goal now. And I just want to float an idea, which again is based on something you said a while ago, which is uh, uh, you had mentioned uh, at the very least we ought to shoot for having a main session in Cairo focused on rights uh, so that uh, we're not presenting anybody with a completed bill of rights. We're not even agreeing among ourselves on what the rights are, but at least we're getting people focused on, on the dialogue and uh, possibly privileging ourselves who are concerned about rights in that dialogue by being the ones who are framing it, which I think, I say that in a good sense, you know, that we are privileging ourselves and that we have values that we want to advance and so we are in, in putting them into the dialogue in a way. And let me just tell you, this is a point of passion with me because you know, I've been around for 10 years working uh, in ICANN, and from the very beginning, we were confronted with a situation in which uh, decisions affecting rights were being made, and certain kinds of rights dialogues and claims were basically excluded from the dialogue and still are. So for example, when we talk about uh, new top level domains, uh, we had to fight very hard to get freedom of expression to even be recognized as one of the considerations in the granting of these new TLDs. And that, that hard fought semi victory is now being chipped away even by the staff. And frankly, we were kind of disappointed